uh, keep it brief and talk to you about a few things. Um, those very kind words by Dr. Mukherjee and none of it is true. Um, what I would say is this, uh, most of you haven't heard my jokes. I tell the same jokes over and over, so I'll start with a joke and maybe some of you haven't heard it. So there's a, there's a doctor who's about to do a procedure and he, he tells the patient, he goes, Paul, everything's gonna be okay. Paul, don't worry, we're gonna do just great. Paul, you're gonna be just fine. And the patient looks up and he goes, I'm not Paul. I'm Sean. He goes, no, no, no. I'm Paul. Don't worry. It's going to be fine, Sean. So, you know, we're going to talk about adult congenital heart disease, but, you know, what we want to do in, this, in our community here in West Texas is really change cardiovascular care. And it's been a wonderful to work with all the physicians here in the community. Uh, I'll give you a quick anecdote. In 2017, we did zero advanced structural procedures, and today, we're on pace probably this year to 200. Um, we're probably going to do uh, some of the procedures that Dr. Nagarajarao, Dr. Siddiqui had spoken to you, to you about. Uh, we're on pace to do 100 transcatheter aortic valve replacements this year. Uh, Dr. Evening does these structural procedures for left atrial appendage closures as well. We're probably on close on track to do 80 to 100 this year. Um, so as a community, with our partnership with Texas Tech and uh, UMC, we've been able to really improve cardiovascular care for the so we're hopeful that we can continue to do that. Today we're going to talk about something that probably is a little more unique or a little strange. It's, it's called adult congenital heart disease. And, and what that means is basically people who have bad plumbing, but they grow up with bad plumbing. And we try to sort of jerry-rig the bad plumbing. The uh, adult congenital heart disease, you know, I show this picture. Um, it's one in 100 patients, okay? So only 1% of the population has adult congenital heart disease. But the numbers are changing. And what I start with this is so that you can understand a little bit about how this all started. So when we talk about cardiovascular surgery and we talk about the advancements that occur in adult surgery, they all actually started with kids. The, bi the bypass machine, all the things that we did started with the initial surgeries in children. And in 1944 in Johns Hopkins, uh, they actually performed one of the first surgeries. Uh, they didn't do bypass surgery because bypass surgery didn't exist. You weren't able to stop the heart. They did this on a heart that was beating. And most of these children died. They had something known as called Tetralogy of Fallot. And what that mean, basically means is those patients were blue babies. That means that they didn't get oxygen, that their circulation wasn't hooked up. So what they actually did was ingenious. They took blood flow from the aorta on the left side of the heart and essentially hooked it up to the lung artery, which is, if you remember your circulation, the right heart sends all the blood to the lungs and the left heart sends the blood to the body. But if you don't communicate between the two appropriately and you don't get oxygen, you can't do that. So they said, well, why don't we send the blood from the left side of the heart back to the right side of the heart? And that's how uh, congenital heart surgery began. And so this is uh, uh, basically, they, they took the left subclavian artery, and I don't know if you can see my pointer, this is the left subclavian artery, they, they just, they clipped it, they took it out, and they hooked it up to the pulmonary artery. So the red blood would go back to get more red, because it wasn't really that red to begin with, it was kind of bluish, and then it would get oxygen and come back. So if you examine these patients, what would happen is their left arm would be smaller than their right arm because they no longer had a subclavian artery. Or you would check their pulse and they'd have no pulse. A lot of these patients don't know what the heck happened to them. So when you come and you see them, you actually have to examine them pretty closely. They'll have a left thoracotomy. In fact, um, one of the patients that was done with a pot shunt, which is hooking up the aorta to the pulmonary artery, she recently died in 2010. So if you think about it, 50, 1950, these patients, many of these patients died within the first year of life. So these advancements really changed the way things occurred. Vivian Thomas here is pictured on both the bottom and up here. If, he, if you haven't seen this movie, you should see the movie called Something the Lord Made. It's actually a very good movie. It, it describes how Vivian Thomas did all these experiments for Dr. Blaylock about trying to figure out how to help these babies, so they did all these animal experiments. So the story goes, and it's true, 
Blaylock decides to take this kid to go do the surgery. Well, during the surgery, he doesn't know what to do. And remember, this is the time, 1940s, this is, there's racism. Vivian Thomas was not even allowed into the operating room to do that. So he kind of calls him to say, come to my back and just walk me through the steps that you do for the experiment. And so he helps him, coaches him during the surgery. Patient survives, okay? Patient lives and does well. And this is like the first advancement. But a lot of the credit goes to Vivian Thomas because without his, uh, and, and, and the other thing that he felt, you know, he never was, he wanted to become a physician but never could because of multiple reasons. But the story is really interesting. So Thomas is Vivian Thomas. Blaylock, Dr. Blaylock is a surgeon. Taussig is pictured in the top left. She's deaf. I don't know how she became a physician or even listen because she couldn't hear anything. So she was deaf as a doorknob. And so she would somehow tell what people had by just kind of feeling uh, their heart. And I think, and I'm not exactly clear, but I think when they put her into pediatric cardiology, she's really the mother of pediatric cardiology. Everyone that ever learned anything, all the different big divisions now, the biggest hospitals in the country, Boston Children's, Texas Children's, all these hospitals, all of them were trained, the lineage goes back to this lady. And so it's pretty interesting, but she decided that these kids couldn't die, so she kept bugging Dr. Blaylock to do these surgeries and figure out ways to do it. And so between the three of them, they came up with this. It's, it's kind of cool to hear about this stuff just because it's important from a historical perspective when we talk about things that change. So I, I like to tell that story so you can understand it. In that, in that picture, is a, a famous surgeon who will come up in the next picture, uh, who's uh, Denton Cooley. Uh, Denton Cooley uh, was the intern, and he's the famous heart surgeon that a lot of people have heard about, but he was the intern during that procedure down here somewhere. So there's a lot of people that made that happen. It's pretty interesting. So most of these people during that time period in the 40s, they died, right? If they had congenital heart, congenital heart problem, they didn't survive. And so um, I show these pictures because um, it kind of gives you an idea what they were doing. So Robert Gross, you know, they didn't know how to stop the heart. So this picture really fascinates me because they didn't know how to stop the heart, so they decided, well, if we can't stop the heart, we can close holes in the heart. So in order to close a hole in the heart, usually you have to see, and the surgeon stitches it now, and they go on the heart and lung machine, and they can stop the heart and do it all. Back then, they couldn't, so they decided, screw it, we'll try something crazy. So what was crazy? You ever see those wine glasses? So if you make a big well and the heart's still beating, the blood will come up. So while the blood was coming up, they would stick the hole in their hand and they're blind and they try to sew wherever this hole, oh, there's the hole. And then they sew it, these patients didn't do well. Okay? A lot of them died. So this was one of the early inventions of trying to do congenital heart surgery. So then they came up with another idea. This was the heart lung machine but what they did is they decided, okay, we don't know how to stop the heart. We don't know how to do bypass. We'll take the blood from the parent and run that blood back through the baby when we do this. So they did this, 19 of the 20 patients died. This is the only heart operation that anyone can claim has a 200% mortality because you can kill not only the baby or the kid, but the parent, okay? So these are the types of innovation. Try to put up an IRB for this type of study today. You would never get it. They'd kill you. You'd get fired, even thinking about it. So the famous story is that Ben Cooley, so there's only like three places that are doing congenital heart surgery, right? Minnesota, Boston, and then Houston with Tex Children. So Den, Den Cooley gets in a plan and says, tells Dan McNamara, he's the pediatric cardiology chief. Dan McNamara came to Houston and he was practicing pediatric cardiology for Texas Children's out of a garage. Today, they're the number one pediatric cardiology program in the country by US News and World Report. If you go there, it's like a mecca. There's like three buildings that are 24 inch time, but that's where they started. So he says, he gives McNamara, I got a great idea. We're gonna go to Minnesota and go see this stuff that you know these guys are doing. So he takes them and flies out. So they fly out the first night, I forget the surgeon. The surgeon was a party animal. So they stayed up to like midnight with this guy, doing all this stuff. And then the next morning they had to go see this other surgeon. Well, he was pretty straight laced. So they were hungover <laughs> and had to talk to this guy for all day. So when he's coming back, he's talked to him about this. He goes, you're not doing those on our patient. We're not gonna do that. So Cooley invents his own bypass. Everyone invents certain things 
they invent their own bypass machine to do that. So that's sort of the history of some of these things when you talk about it, it's very interesting. And, and, and Dan McNamara was the first pediatric cardiologist who was ever the president of the American College of Cardiology. Remember, pediatric cardiologists are not very common in uh, our percentage wise, so he's also very famous for that. And then Deb Cooley is the one on the, the other picture, the famous heart surgeon from, from Houston. So with some of these advancements, you can see how surgery has improved and the survival has increased, okay? So in the 60s, they figure out a few things. You start to have bypass, things happen. People, remember, this is not a really hot, large bar. You're surviving to one year. One year is not very long, because sometimes these kids could survive to one year on their own. So there's new advancements. And some of this, forgive me, is gonna be complicated, but basically some of these babies were born with one chamber that could pump the blood to the body. They were only born with a left ventricle or a right ventricle, and they may not have had connections to the lung arteries or vice versa. So what people did is they basically jerry-rigged the, the circulation. So if you don't have blood flow that goes to the lung arteries appropriately, you made it up. And what you would make up is you would make up extra connections. So if I can walk you through this just briefly, what you see here is called the Delenn operation. And what that is is where the SVC is hooked up to the pulmonary artery. Normally the SVC goes to the right atrium. Right, the blood drains to the right side of the heart. But in this operation, the SVC is hooked up to the pulmonary artery. So if you're not born with the right ventricle, what we thought was, let's bypass the right ventricle, because you only have a left ventricle, let's say, or you only have one ventricle. So why don't we bypass the right ventricle and send all the blood to the lungs? So you hooked up the SVC to the pulmonary artery. That's all part of it, but you still had the IVC blood to deal with. Right, because you're still mixing blue blood with red blood. If you did that, the kid would still be 80% saturated, not 100%. Does that make sense? I know it's kind of like this plumbing screwed up. It's really screwed up. So what happened in 1973 is this guy named Fontaine from France, he decided to hook up the IVC to the pulmonary artery. And if you see that, so now you have blood flow that's bypassing the right heart, and now you can just live on one ventricle. Does that make sense? So blood flow that normally went from the SVC to the right atrium, now it goes to the pulmonary artery. And then blood flow from the IVC went to the pulmonary artery. So you don't have a right ventricle, you just, you don't need it. They said, we fixed everything, don't worry about it. Well, that turns out to be true, you can make them survive. And this is a picture of it. So basically, as it's advanced, we realized that this didn't do well. They did it on three patients, I think one survived. One out of the three but it was a landmark procedure because now what we do with people, they call them single ventricle. When you have one ventricle and you're born, you do a Blaylock Thomas Tausig shunt at four days old. You do a Glenn operation at four months old, and then you do a Fontan at four years old. So if you remember the old Moses Malone, you guys are probably too young for that 444, went to the finals with the 76ers. Uh, so that, that, that time period, that's how you remember, four days, four months, four years, okay? So this is, kind of that sort of screwed up circulation in its final. So now blood flow, blue, can go to the lungs, get oxygen and come back to the left heart and you never need the right ventricle. That works for a couple of decades or for five, 10 years and things can fail. So people over time will fail. And so we have all these people that we've screwed up their plumbing that are in clinic and we don't know what to do with them. So now, you know, we sort of kick the can down the road. So here's a picture of it, just so you can see it, okay? So that's a pigtail. This is a baby, I think, here that we did at UMC maybe a year ago uh, that basically has a lung artery connection going in there. And this is the IVC right here. And you see how it doesn't go to the heart, okay? And then, I don't know what this is. A oh yeah, that's, that's all of it, like kind of connected. So that's the IVC going to the lung artery. It just give you a flavor of how screwed up it can be and, and, and what people do to make it work. And so if you do this, now we've got people that live past a year and they live now in the modern era, greater than 90% survival. Uh, this is a case, some of you may have seen this, but this is a case of a girl, she's still, uh, still trying to get her to get surgery. You know, there's socioeconomic concerns here. There's problems with getting people to places they have to go. 
I needed to get her a dentist appointment. And she couldn't get a dentist appointment, so I could clear her for surgery. You know, it might be a case that if she can't get surgery, we might do something where we, this area is narrow, way up there. I might just stench her because we can't get her to get this whole thing fixed. I want her to have a complete revision of that weird jury rigging because that, that's going to be important because right now she has a pressure difference. So what it means is here she's got a pressure that's higher than here. So blood is having trouble getting through. And even if it's one or two millimeters of mercury difference, it can be a big problem for these guys and so they're very desaturated when you put on a treadmill she can't go very far she recently got married she's like 25 you know she's a really young girl and you know unfortunately we're trying to make the circulation work as long as it can and eventually you're talking about even heart transplant but with the limited resources that's going to be difficult okay so that's so complex congenital heart disease complex means single ventricle transposition truncus arteriosus all these kind of complex it means blue babies and they're surviving now up to 80%. And the interesting point here is if you look at these numbers, there's more adults than are, there are kids with congenital heart disease. Congenital heart disease implies that kids have the heart disease, but actually it's now adults because they did such a good job of fixing them, they're all screwed up and they're gonna be in your clinics or you're gonna be seeing them in the hospital trying to figure out what to do with them, okay? Questions? You can stop me anytime. So this is something we're very proud of because there are about, a, I don't know, I never counted it, but I think it's like 120 clinics. So we applied for accreditation and that's us in El Paso. So between like Houston and Phoenix, there's not really a lot of places. There's like a couple of clinics. And so uh, it's kind of a very small population. But if you look in Texas, we have close to 30 million people. We probably only serve less than 10% of the population. We have like a group that gets together every so often and talks about these patients. And we're underserved. Uh, in our clinic, we're seeing 200 patients now, and that already puts us like at the eighth or 10th biggest clinic in the state. But 200 patients in our population size, we probably have 1,500 to 2,000 patients easy that are running around God knows where. And um, they're, they just show up periodically and they don't know what happened to them. So even with the numbers, even a place like Texas Children's, which does 2,300, and a friend of mine, Peter Armist does, they probably have thousands of patients, but they don't even know, they're not touching all those patients for a variety of reasons. So there's a lot of patients that unfortunately aren't taken care of appropriately. So this is ours. Um, so this is kind of just giving you an idea of what we're doing. I was just gonna show you a few cases, quick, quick cases, because we don't have a lot of time. Mostly just to kind of give you a flavor of what adult congenital heart disease is, and if you have questions, you can ask us. This is a lady who still I haven't fixed, and probably won't, but she's a 48-year-old lady who had a bunch of holes in her heart. She had an ASD, which is a hole in the top part of the heart between the right atrium and the left atrium that she had fixed. And she had a pacemaker, and she was referred for some sort of blockage in her valve. And what we found was that she had a right atrium that was quite large, and the reason was is she had a what you can see here is this color flow that's going, that's from the left ventricle to the right atrium. And that's not supposed to be there. Um, it's the left ventricle is supposed to pump the blood to the aorta, not to the right atrium. That's like, you know, going backwards. That's going the wrong way. And so this is called a Gerbode defect. And so if you see this here, this is the aorta. This is the right atrium, left atrium. Again, blood's supposed to go out. It's going the wrong way. So when the surgeon closed that hole, he left a residual defect and this lady was having atrial fibrillation. So she ended up going for a pulmonary venous, uh, oh, sorry, sorry for, uh, for an ablation from the electrical doctors to try to help. She's still having, so you see right here, so this is the left ventricle, and then what you see here is gonna see the lighting up of the, the right atrium, right there. And so probably her atrial arrhythmias are a combination of factors. If you have an ASD, you have an increasing <coughs> incidence of atrial arrhythmias, which could be AFib or anything else as they get older. And then this shunt doesn't help because it's sending a lot of blood to the right atrium. When I did her calculations, there's something called QPQS, which is how, many, how much blood flow is going across that hole. And if it's really high, that means that you may need to close the hole. Hers wasn't very high, so I thought I could leave it alone but she's having so many arrhythmias and so many uh, shortness of breath that we may end up sending her for surgical closure and maybe doing a maze or something else during that time period. 
what you see here is the pulmonary artery that's quite dilated. But this is a Gervodi defect, the left ventricle, the right atrium. And so that's kind of the area you can talk about for a shunt. So this is another case. We got like 20 minutes, so we're gonna fly through a few. I've interspersed some that we've done recently and some of the older ones, just to give you a flavor of things. This is tetralogy of Fallot. So the defect is a BSD, overriding aorta, pulmonary stenosis. So what happens is instead of sending blood flow this way, because it's narrow, you send blood flow to the aorta. And so the blue blood that comes back never gets oxygenated, it goes to the heart, to the left side, and people used to die of something under the tent spell. So anytime a kid started crying and screaming, they used to freak out because all your blood then will be shunted from the right side to the left side. You'll never get oxygen. So if a kid came in screaming and had a tetralogy flow, you really wanted to give them something to kind of calm them down, morphine or their favorite toy, or today it probably is an iPad. So, you know, something to keep them calm, keep them calm, and that would stop some of those problems. So this is what we talked about. He had a BT shunt, repaired it five years. This guy's in my clinic. He's, he's an interesting guy. He's a little kooky, but very nice guy who seen probably every cardiologist in town and somehow ended up at our doorstep because probably we were new, so he's like another cardiologist. So eventually what we ended up doing was, uh, you know, he had, so in tetralogy of Fallot, what they do is they fix initially to try to get more circulation like we talked about the shunt, and then they repair the hole in the heart, the BSD, and then eventually they end up having to repair the pulmonary valve because that's a problem. But unfortunately, if it's not something that man-made or was given to you, it can deteriorate. In this case, it deteriorated. So the guy was sent for surgery, uh, actually was sent to Dallas Children's for a fix, and unfortunately, they had difficulty doing his procedure, so they sent him back. And then eight years later, he's like, you know, they told me I should have something done. I was like, when? 10 years ago, I was like, great. That's kind of a long time ago. If I was Marty McFly, I could fix this, but not today. You know, uh, so anyway, so this is the right ventricle, and it really doesn't move. And you can see how the left ventricle's pancake. So the right ventricle's really, it's like, you know, it's supposed to be Danny DeVito and the left ventricle's already Arnold Schwarzenegger and this is really screwed up. So if you haven't seen twins, you should. So in any case, this guy, so what they did is they decided, you know, why don't we go ahead and fix the pulmonary valve and we can do that percutaneously. So this is something that Philip Bonhoeffer came up with in Germany in 2001. And this is actually the technology that's now used for the idea that was now used for transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So you can see how this sort of pioneered that because this actually was the beginning and it was called the melody valve. And um, the reason I think it's called a melody valve is the guy is a con he's in some doctor's orchestra that we would see and uh, he's, uh, I think he's a violinist or something. So I think that's how these melody, harmony, all these names came up because he's a musician. And anyways, when do you fix it if you want to? Well, if the right ventricle isn't working, if you can see there wasn't squeezing, it's dilated, it's big, or if the guy has symptoms, it's short of breath, or the gal does. So that's basically what happens. And eventually, as you can tell in that picture back there, the left ventricle is not moving as well because it's getting pushed. So that's called ventricular-ventricular uh, interaction or concordance. And so if you have this interaction where the right ventricle is really big, it can actually impact the left ventricle filling and actually make things worse. So for all those reasons, we said, okay, we'll go ahead and do them. But the guy had hardware, I mean, he had a lot of devices. In fact, he had one device because he died, had sudden cardiac death, which happens with tetralogy of Fallot. If your QRS is greater than 180 milliseconds, you're a higher risk of sudden cardiac death. If your left ventricle and diastolic pressure is greater than 15, that's also a high risk of sudden cardiac death. This guy passed out, died. So they said, screw it, you're gonna get a pace, you're gonna get a device. I think he got a, device, a pacemaker initially, then he got, they couldn't do anything, so they abandoned it, and then they went to the other side, they put him on another one. So this guy had stuff every, I mean, he had every lead and every problem, and they abandoned, put in it, so he has an ICD. And he also had this valve that was a problem because it was stenotic, and also was not working well. So every time that they ballooned him, this is what happened in Dallas Children's, they said, every time they ballooned him, it, they couldn't get stability. So if you try to put a valve on there, and you get it, and it falls, you're not gonna put the valve where it's supposed to be, so that's a problem. And no one wanted to operate on it because he had like 10 surgeries, so they's like, you know, if you operate on someone who has a lot of surgeries, what happens is the right ventricle gets stuck to the, uh, to the sternum. So when the surgeon goes on bypass and decides he's gonna cut the sternum, he cuts the right ventricle. So then it's a bloody mess. It's a lot of fun, I'm sure, if you're a surgeon, 
uh, it's probably not a good day and you have to run on the bypass very quickly. So those guys take a lot of very delicate dissection. So once they have three, four open heart surgeries, they say, you know what, you fix it percutaneously or do whatever you can because we don't want to operate on this guy anymore. So that's what happened. So I thought, okay, we can fix this. You know, Dallas Children's smarter than us, so why, you know, maybe we could figure it out, but it, clearly we weren't able to. So what we ended up doing is um, just putting a bunch of wires, like multiple wires. And I'll tell you, the guys that helped us were actually some of the people that do this procedure. Herschel will know, but Tom Summit came up with the idea in like a second. So he said, okay, put three wires. I said, I already have two. He said, put another one. Put another one, put a plug <coughs> hanger, put this wire. We just put as many wires as we could so we could get stability. And so once we got this, we knew we could put the valve because we're not moving anymore. Does that make sense? Because we know we're going to be stable. And so we ended up putting this Edward Safekin valve in. And this is just to show you how long it takes to put it in on the right side of the heart. On the left side of the heart, we, we just, we rush, 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 rush. But the right side of the heart, what will happen is you'll lose your cardiac output, you'll lose your oxygenation, and then you'll recover. I've only had one case that we've had to do something really immediate. Most of the time the patients recover beautifully without any problem. But this is telling you how long we're still, you know, do you like it? I like it. Do you like it? We well, just blow up the balloon, just fit, you know, like, so we're just still talking about it. But it takes, if you look at the tavern procedures, which you may have shown some pictures of, it's like boom, 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 quick, quick, quick. This one, we're still blowing up the balloon. We're still at limited cardiac up. It's amazing how one side of the heart is so much different in terms of how you do it to the left side of the heart, and you can get away with it. I always say you can get away with murder until you get caught. So this is, that's the valve now. And the funny thing is the guy came in and he goes, I want a watchman. I was like, you don't need a watchman. You don't need anything. You have enough hardware in your body. Do not come back and talk to us anymore about the procedure. Very nice guy. So this is a lady I think we did a few weeks ago. She's a 29-year-old lady with tetralogy of flow. We did her here at UMC, and she had pulmonary stenosis. The reason I show you this picture is to give you an orientation of what we're going to look at. But the left pulmonary artery is very narrowed in her, and she had come in with palpitation, sink, uh, shortage of breath, and I think like PVCs and stuff like that. She's tetralogy of Fallot, so you think ultimately that her valve is the problem, but if her RV function and RV size aren't dilated, then we generally try to kick the can down the road. The reason is, is once you replace the valve, you have a finite amount of time where you have to do that again in 10 years because it's not man-made. I mean, it's man-made, it's not God, it's given, so they fail, the valves fail. So whenever we replace a valve, we've done about 10, we know that in about 10 years or eight years or six years, they're gonna fail, just like the surgical valves fail. So that's why, you know, you, you wanna kick the can down the road as much as you can. So the idea with her was, if we could increase her lung capacity, so her problem is the blood flow goes up and it leaks backwards, right? So it's like a door that's open. Think of it like if this room had that door, but people kept coming to the party, and you want to kick them out, but they don't leave because there's, there's no exit. They're just going to keep coming in. And so the right side gets bigger and bigger. So eventually she will need a valve replacement. And I think she's a patient of Dr. Alcatibs. But what, what we were thinking is if we can improve the lung LPA, we'll improve her capacitance, which means we can send blood to the left side as well as the right side well, and that might decrease her pulmonary regurgitation, if that makes any sense. Just know that it's something that we did that may not work, but we're hoping to, because you usually don't do that in an adult, you do it in a 10-year-old. So what happens is, in, in tetralogy of Perlot, the pulmonary artery, you think the pulmonary artery comes on the right ventricle, goes to each lung, you think like that. But it's actually like this, it's rotated, they're always rotated. And in TETS, which is tetralogy of Perlot, LPA stents are very common, and they're kinked. So usually you have 90% of your blood flow to the right lung, and maybe 10% to the left lung. So in her, when we did the MRI, the radiologist said, I can't see the Dan LPA. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, it's like, it's like two millimeters or one millimeter. It wasn't that narrow, but it was narrow. It's probably three millimeters when we measured it. So what we ended up doing, this is the left pulmonary artery uh, picture, and this is another version of it laterally. So it's narrow, it's focal. We ended up putting a stent in there, and it became 10 millimeters. Hopefully this helps her a bit. During the procedure, um, you have to crimp a stent which means you have to, so in pediatrics, nothing is made for kids because no one really, unfortunately, cares about kids from a money standpoint. 99% of our diseases, I said, is adult 
one percent is kids. So even the stents are made like we get stents for coronaries, we can pull them off the shelf and throw them into a, an adult. But for kids, we don't have that, and they grow. So we often have to uh, make our own stents, or we make the stents, but we crimp them. So we put it on a balloon and we tighten it, and then we put it in a sheath and pray that it doesn't come off of the balloon when we're going up. So we figured out ways to do that. Well, so during the procedure, I wasn't so smart, but I, I got it out there and I was trying to play with it to try to get it the right place. The damn thing came too far back. I said, son of a gun. So, cause if you, cause now once the thing is out, you can't really, you have to use it, you have to put it wherever it is. So we were able to play with it a little bit, but you know, you could, if you miss, you're in trouble because you're gonna need open heart surgery right off the bat. Cause it'll bounce around. And then it's like trying to figure out ways to fix it without screwing it up. So that's where you, she ended up. She's doing well, that's an x-ray of it. and tells you like the left pulmonary artery comes at a different angle. All right, uh, I don't think we have, two, we have eight more minutes. You guys want me to keep going or we can stop? It's just cases of random things. <clears throat> keep going, okay, we'll, we'll do it really fast. You won't know what happened. So a uh, 44 year old patient with dyspnea, I think I presented this, some of you may have seen this, but this guy, he went to Texas Children's and had surgery, and I think he was a patient of Dr. Goff for a long time. He had repair, and this is the same thing, so if the left pulmonary artery doesn't work, sometimes you can be tetralogy of fellow with an absent LP, meaning your left pulmonary artery never was born, you never got it. Anyway, so he had multiple surgeries, and he has something called a homograph where they basically put a conduit, which is a man-made tube from the right ventricle of the pulmonary artery, and um, most of the time when you do that, it fails, and it fails with calcium and it leaks. And so he basically only had uh, one lung artery, which is the right lung and nothing in the left lung. So usually you put a pulmonary valve here um, in this guy, but because he only had one lung, we could put the valve anywhere because it doesn't really matter because it's gonna go to the same place. So here it was really hard and it was calcified. So we said, why don't we just go up here and put it up? So we put the valve there. The guys, I think he sells <coughs> Toyotas? Toyotas, yeah, he sells Toyotas. So I remember joking with the cap up stuff because I was like, if you want a car, you should ask this guy. <laughs> he's really, every time he comes to the clinic, he's ready to sell me a car. So <laughs> he's, he's a really nice guy and um, you know, so anyway, so he's doing better. His exercise capacity has improved and we've been able to put the pulmonary valve out there. Here's a picture of something we've done before on one of the cases here in town. So if you pay attention here, you can crack valves. It's not something you want to do every day and it probably can be a little unnerving, but you see that there, if you can, I'm just gonna let play. See right there, you can crack that valve. See that it's gonna pop, it's not a pop. So this is a, this is a surgical valve, so you can do that I tried to only put El Paso cases, in that case, so these are all just El Paso. So these, that you can put, you can crack a valve, and then you can put whatever you want in there, because if you need to make a valve, let's say the surgeon, for whatever reason, could only get a 20, and there's a real big gradient, meaning that there's a narrowing, so the pressure difference is there, you can crack a valve, and then you can put something bigger in. You have to be careful, because you can also tear, and tearing can be catastrophic. The patient can die and need emergency surgery. There's bailouts for that, you can put covered stents and things like that, but usually you don't want to be in that situation. That can make for a, a really tough case and a bad day. But so anyways, this is the same idea, putting a valve up there. So you've seen that enough. This is a patient who had a coarctation. So for time's sake, we'll go fast, basically narrowing. Here you see uh, where that narrowing is. The patient had a difference of 90 millimeters of mercury from the top part to the bottom part. And in this case, you see this picture that shows you all the collaterals that are going around. It's like, you know, in I-10, in, in El Paso, there's always traffic. It's always because I-10 is stuck. And so this is like, I, I describe it as like, everyone figuring out a way to get around I-10. So that's what this is, right? Everyone's going around somewhere to get the blood flow down. So the reason I show you this picture and this is, it's a covered stent. The data shows that if it's less than a three millimeter hole, a covered stent's good because you might tear the aorta. So this case, we use that this case we did, this is a kid from Juarez that came in a few weeks ago, and he had TB and something else and something else and something else, and I can't remember. I also remember that they couldn't figure out a way to bring him over here. <coughs> Dr. Canales was really kind, because he has a clinic across 
in water, so he helped us get the patient over. And anyways, we didn't end up having to use a covered stent because his gradient was only 50 or 60, and it ended up putting um, another stent in there that's not covered. A covered stent means that if you tear it, there's covering around it so that when it tears, it's gonna be contained. So it's like a it's like a tissue around it, the best way to describe it. All right, so that's that. This is a case we're gonna do. I just talked to the guy. Um, this is Dr. One of the surgeons that repaired him and did a great repair. He's 37 now, but he has, when, when you repair something, uh, you can repair it with a, with a graft or like, you know, if it's, it's stuck, what the surgeon does is they cut it and then they open it and then they stitch it together. So they stitch it together and um, basically what ends up happening over time is it becomes a dilate. That's what we know. So he's 37 when they picked him at 10, it's that. So he's gonna get a, he's actually going to a surgeon to get a carotid subclavian bypass so that when we go back, we can cover the subclavian all the way across, if that makes sense. So because if you cover, this thing is big. I don't know how big, but that's big. And it's gonna rupture, so that's the concern. So what you wanna do is put a covered stent graft through that entire area, kind of like what they do with abdominal area aneurysms. This would be called like a T-bar, I guess. And so he's probably gonna have that done in a few weeks. But, but before we do that, he's gonna get a carotid to subclavian bypass so that if we cover the subclavian artery with a covered area, it'll be covered, right? So blood can't go through anymore. If you cover it, you'll still have a bypass from the carotid to the subclavian. So he doesn't get arm clotted. So these are just some cases, it's, it's 2.30. I don't wanna keep going with more cases because it's just gonna to be too many. But um, that'll give you an idea of what's going on and uh, kind of like uh, an idea of what's the flavor of patients out, out there. And if you need help or concerns, you know, you got a good team here that can sort of help navigate those patients because they do exist and they do deserve appropriate care. And so plumbing is important. <laughs> All right, thank you. Since Dr. Rabati is here, I'll say plumbing and electricity both are important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but thank you, thank you, Dr. Mulukwetla, that was excellent. Any questions for... Uh, it's too uh, complicated for us to ask questions. Okay. <laughs> yeah, even I don't know. Uh, the, the, that's amazing what you, what you brought to the community. Um, this really made a big difference to a lot of our patients. Thank you.